All right. I also want to welcome there are people who come from Denver tonight to be here and Pennsylvania to be here. We welcome you. Um, open up to Genesis. Genesis 24. Genesis 24, verse 50. Then Laban and Bethuel replied, The matter comes from the Lord, so we cannot speak to you about her good. Here is Rivka, Rebecca. Before you take her and go and let her be the wife of your master's son, as the Lord has spoken. When Abraham's servant heard their words, he bowed himself to the ground before the Lord the servant brought out articles of silver and articles of gold and garments and gave them to Rebekah. He also gave precious things to her brother and to her mother. Then he and the men who were with him ate and drank and spent the night. When they arose in the morning, he said, Send me away to my master. But her brother and her mother said, Let the girl stay with us a few days, say ten, after which she may go. He said to them, Do not delay me. Since the Lord has prospered my way, send me away that I may go to my master. And they said, we will call the girl and ask and consult what she wants. And they called Rizka, Rebecca, and said to her, will you go with this man? And she said, I will go. So they sent her away. They sent their sister Rebecca away and her nurse with Abraham's servant and his men. They blessed Rebecca and said to her, may you, our sister, become thousands of ten thousands and may your descendants possess the gates of those who hate them. Then Rebekah arose with her maids, and they mounted the camels and followed the man. So the servant took Rebekah and departed. Now, this is not what you might expect for a Good Friday message. But if you come to Beth Israel, you come to the Jerusalem Center, you should know the foundation of one of the greatest mysteries in the Bible, which is the mystery of the bride and groom. But in order to open up the revelation that we're going to open up tonight, we have to lay the foundation of this mystery. In the days of the Bible, in the days of Messiah on earth, a Hebrew boy and girl would grow up separately, of course, in separate houses. Often they would know nothing of each other until the time of their meeting. They knew one day they would marry, but not always to whom. They would undoubtedly, the Hebrew virgin would dream of the day of her wedding, of finding her beloved and being joined to him. The marriage could come about by the meeting of the two, which that happens in life, or it could be arranged by the parents of the two. And when the two are come of age, the preparation for marriage begins. The marriage could only come about in this way. The Hebrew bridegroom would have to leave his house, and journey to the house of the bride, her father's house. Wherever she lives, he has to visit her, whether down the street or down, the, down across the land. He has to go to her house. No matter whether she lives in a mansion or a mud hut, he has to go to her house. It is the visit of the bridegroom. She or her house must receive him, open the door, and let him in. And there inside her house, he pledges to her his love. A gift of his love has to be part of it. He has to offer to her a gift, a costly gift. The gift is to show his love. The gift is called the mohar. It has to be costly. It's the sign of his love or the sign of the love of his house for her. Just as with Rebecca, it says, the servant gave to them Articles of silver, articles of gold and linen. And then he asked her to be his wife. Will she go with him? And she has to choose. He is likely, the bridegroom is likely a stranger. It could be a representative of the bridegroom or it could be the bridegroom himself. One often, that, a man often that she never saw before or she never met. To say yes, she has to leave everything she has ever known to embrace Someone she doesn't. And to leave everything she's seen and known from childhood, everything that's familiar.
This is Jonathan Cohn, and what you're about to hear was recorded live at the Beth Israel Worship Center, an end-time gathering of Jew and Gentile, one in Messiah, in northern New Jersey. To get in touch, to get more information, a list of teachings and tapes, special resources and free gifts, or how to find salvation, new life, and your calling, how to attend a service, or how you can have a part in Hope of the World, an end-time ministry of Jew and Gentile, spreading the word of God to the ends of the earth, just write to Hope of the World, Box 1111, Lodi, L-O-D-I, New Jersey, 07644, USA. And now, the message. She's going to go to a place she has no idea of, to leave the people she's known, the family she's known, to go to a house she has not. Leave an old house for a new house she's only heard about. She's nervous. It means everything. Letting go of everything she's known for the chance to gain something she's never had. If she says no, she might miss everything, the purpose of her life. If she says yes, the mohar is officially given and received, the gift of the bridegroom to the bride. And she is, by the giving of that gift, once that gift is given and received, she is technically set free from the bounds of her old house. The two of them, generally what happens is they then pledge each other, pledge themselves to each other in marriage. They enter into a covenant. They drink a cup of wine together. And a blessing is said, she is now considered to be the bride, the wife, the kala in Hebrew. Say kala. And he is now called the chatan in Hebrew. Say chatan, the bridegroom. The two are deemed married. Now, in the, in the story in Genesis, the account, the little, the changes, they didn't, they didn't wait, she didn't wait there for a while, and he didn't leave and come back because it was just too far. It was a whole other land. But what happens in the normal course of the Hebrew marriage, the biblical marriage, is the two are now deemed to be married by their pledge after the covenant is sealed. Then the Hatan, the bridegroom, will say farewell, and he will leave that house, leave the house of the bride, and then he goes, the first visit of the bridegroom is over. That first visit is called the Kiddushim. It means, it comes from the word Kadosh, holy, or sanctified, or pledge to each other. Because they each pledge themselves to each other. That is the time of making the covenant and receiving the covenant. And she consecrates herself, makes herself Kiddush, or Kiddush, holy to the bridegroom. And the bridegroom, Kiddush, to the bride, holy, pledge, betrothed. And then the bridegroom returns to his house, and thus begins the great separation period. The chatan and the kala, the bride and groom, each in their own house. They cannot see each other. The groom spends the time of separation preparing a home for the bride, a home to receive the bride. And there was a law in Israel that the home that he prepares had to be at least as good or better than the one she's leaving. He could not bring her into a dump unless it was a better dump than she came from. And so the bride spends her time of separation preparing herself for the bridegroom, for marriage, for becoming beautiful. This went on for a year. Can you imagine a woman preparing herself for a year? Husbands, yes, you can. But for a year, she's preparing herself not just in that way, but for marriage. So, you know, and so the mohar, the price has been paid, so even though everything looks the same, and she's in the house, she is technically no longer of the house. Everything is different because she's the bride, she's not just a daughter, she's a bride now. That changes everything for her. She's the kala, she's pledged, she's pledged, she has to keep herself holy to him, and not go with anyone else or see any other man. So her room may look the same in her house if she has a room, unless it's all one. It may look, but it's all different now because she's pledged she has a future that is apart from that house. She's no longer bound to the house. Her house is really not her home anymore. It's her bridal chamber. Everything is now for the purpose of preparing the bride for the groom. The door of her heart is opened. Her life is open. And though everything looks the same, she's looking through the eyes of faith or hope in a future event. There's a covenant. 
she is consecrated, and someone who is a, somewhere far away, is, or, or someone she doesn't see, is also consecrated. And so the days she spends there are days of, separate, of getting, saying goodbye, getting ready to say goodbye to her childhood home, letting go of the old house and all the things in it. It's, it's good and it's bad and it's distractions and her toys of youth all letting go of it. And suddenly her circumstances don't matter so much because she's going to be leaving it and she's in love. She's no longer of it anymore. She has one purpose, to get ready for the chatan, the bridegroom, and for the wedding to be beautiful. She has love now and that trumps everything else in her life. She prepares for the great wedding day to come. And the wedding day, finally, the day comes. It's usually a year later, often in the autumn, when the bridegroom prepares himself. He's finished preparing the house. And he gets ready, dressed up as a king, with his men, with a crown, and torchlight. They come in a procession from the bridegroom's house to the bride's house. One more time, it's his second coming. And this time he comes, not as the first coming, just dressed regularly, blending in with everything. He comes as a king. And he comes to, to greet her. And, the, and they, they get ready. They don't know the bride is bathed and, and perfumed and adorned and ready. And they say, look, behold, the bridegroom's coming. And then he comes. And then they stand and see each other face to face. He lifts up the veil. For the first time, they see each other face to face. And then they are lifted on the sedan chair by their friends and carried away in a great procession from the house of the bridegroom, the house of the bride to the house of the bridegroom. She looks back and sees her old life fading away, the old world fading away. And there she's being brought to the new world, the new life into the bridegroom's house where she's welcomed in and they sit under a canopy like king and queen with a canopy, the hoopah, the wedding canopy, for seven days of celebration. And then they slip out together into the bridal chamber or into the, the wedding chamber and they become one. That is the Hebrew wedding. Now you can put together, I'm not going to spell it out for you, because the Holy Spirit's in everything of this. But this is not what I'm, fo I'm not, I'm going to focus on just one thing here. You can, if you are awake, you are here, you are seeing, you see the first coming, the second coming, the se everything, the covenant, all that. But what I want you to focus on tonight is the mohar. That payment, or that gift. Now, it, they said it was, it had to be a minimum of at least 50 shekels, which was a lot of money, whatever it was, whether it's money or a treasure, it's going to be worth more than at least 50 shekels, they say. He'd have to earn it. That husband had to earn it. So he had to, it had to mean a lot to him. Without it, he could not have her. And she could not leave. It represented his sacrifice for her, his love for her, his trustworthiness and faithfulness is guaranteed for her, a token of the future. It was paid. It was a definite thing given that signal that she is no longer who she was, she's now the Kala, the bride. It's the beginning of the new. The Jewish law protected the wife in that the husband, again, could not ask his wife to leave Israel, or if she was in Israel, or Jerusalem, if she was in Jerusalem. And again, she could not leave a good house for a bad one. So the new she was going to had always had to be at least as good or better. The Moha. It all hung on the mohar. Without that, there's no wedding, there's no marriage. What was the mohar? The bridal gift. Number one, it was the sign of the bridegroom's love. It was the cost that it took to set free the bride from her house. It was the price the bridegroom had to render. It was of the bridegroom's life, his essence, his wealth that he gave. It was a gift that he gave. It was that how, that showed how much he would love that woman. And it was that which changed everything for her. It was that that sets the woman free from the bounds of her house. It changes, changes her identity. She is not just the daughter or the sis, younger sister or older sister. She is now the bride. It changes her identity. She's the Kala. It changes her home. 
for her because it used to be her everything she knew. Now it's just it's just a transition place. She's not belonging to it anymore, really. She's belonging to the new home. She's in that home, but she's not of it. The Mohar gives her the power to leave and say goodbye. The Mohar gives her the power to walk and to go from the old to the new. The old life to the new life. She is now, it makes her Kiddushin, it makes her holy or dedicated, consecrated. She must now live as someone who is consecrated. The Mohar makes her life transcendent, meaning she is beyond everything. She's not limited by anything she can see. She's beyond it now. The Mohar gives her hope of a new life. And her, so therefore, whatever she sees, it's not the end of the story anymore. Before, that could have been it. She's got a problem. That's all she knows. But now, she looks at her house. It's, not the end. it's just leading to something better. What does it have to do with you? What does it have to do with tonight? The meaning of life. All existence. This is the meaning of that mystery. All existence is ultimately a love story by God's heart. The mystery begins with the bridegroom, the chatan. And the mystery is that there is one who is the ultimate chatan, the bridegroom of all bridegrooms, who is from the beginning... As, as woman came from the rib of man, so creation came from him. He's the source of all love and he's the only one who fills everything up, without whom everything else is empty and never full. With him, he's the only one who completes the bride and for whom everything else was made. Who is the bridegroom? The bridegroom is God Almighty. The eternal God is the bridegroom. He is the judge, he is the king, he is the almighty, but he's also the bridegroom, the chatan. And what does chatan mean? Chatan means, literally, means the one who joins himself to you. Or joins himself in love to the bride. Who marries. So the idea that God is cold and distant is just the opposite. He is the chatan, the one who longs to join himself to you. Who is the Kala, the bride, the other part of the mystery, she's right here. You either are the bride or you were created to be the bride. You were made to be married. Your soul was made to be joined to God. And that's why if your soul isn't married to God, it's always trying to marry itself to something. Or someone, or some, or something, whether it's a person, whether it's a cause, whether it's a money, or a house, or whether it's some, an alcohol, or something, it's always trying to marry itself. Because you were made to be married to Him, that's why. And it can never become, that's why you think they're never complete, until you are married to the one you were born to be married to. And so here it is, so when you feel empty, it's a good thing. When you feel empty, it's a little sign that you're supposed to be the bride. That you need Him. It's and then interesting because it's often an arranged marriage in the Bible. So you and God is also an arranged marriage. And the two, as they two grow up in different houses, so you are, we are growing up in this world, He is of heaven. Two houses. We start out separate. We're in a temporary place. He's in the eternal. You grew up in your life, and many of you, most of us, didn't really know Him. Like, like, like the bride. But we didn't know it, but yet we longed for Him without even realizing it. Now, in every faith, you have God up there and us down here. And pretty much, how do you get up there? The two houses are separate, but our faith is different. Because it's joined to the mystery of the Hebrew marriage. And according to that mystery, there can be no marriage or love, until the bridegroom makes a journey from his house to our house. God has to make a journey from his house to our house. 2,000 years ago, the Hatan made the journey. Not across the village, and not across the town, but across the universe. Across eternity. Across time and space. God came to our house. The Chatan arrived in our house, in the life of the bride. The Eternal came into time and space, into a world of imperfection, a world of dust and brokenness for one reason, because it was our house. 
And the Hebrew groom must come to the house, even if it's a mud hut and a mess, and he's from a mansion, he must come. And that's about what it was. He came. And the first time the bridegroom comes without great fanfare, he comes um, humbly. You can barely notice him in the crowd. There's no wedding going on. He just comes to the house. So when God came to this realm, he first came humbly. You could, you could, you could see him and not even realize him. He had no majesty that we should be attracted. It never mattered how far away her house was or what kind it was. He'd go. He'd have to go how far away that was. So God visited this tiny blue planet across eternity to the house of Israel, to the house of Bethlehem, because he is the Chatan who joins himself to us. The Chatan enters the house of the Beloved, but according to the mystery, there must be in that first visit, that first coming, that first visit of the bridegroom, not only must he visit, that whole visit centers on something. It centers on the Mohar. It centers on the gift of love to the bride. 2,000 years ago, tonight, Outside Jerusalem, outside the gates, hangs a man, a Jewish rabbi, who has been crucified, bleeding to death, with a name above him saying, Yeshua HaNatri, Jesus of Nazareth, Melech Yehudim, the King of the Jews. He has been despised and rejected, has been spat upon and mocked, and has been crucified stripped of his clothes, hanging on the cross, dying on the cross in Judea somewhere around the year 30, 33 A.D. It happens. It's this, this pathetic sight of, of, of capital punishment, execution of a man of peace, crucified, calling out and closing his eyes. And there the most famous, the most famous event in world history. This event, no matter how much time passes, it's the central event. This event. And here from this you have the cross, and from this you have symbols we touched on last week. The symbol of the cross all over. What is this? What is this thing here? 2000 years. What is it? What you're looking at is the mohar. The mohar, the bridegroom's gift. The mohar of the Almighty God. The Mohar of the living God. The cross is not just an event. The cross is not just an object. The Mohar wasn't just a thing. The Mohar was given because of the bride. The cross is not some separate event you can just read about in history. The, the cross exists because of you. The Mohar exists because of the bride, or it doesn't exist at all. The cross exists not as a separate thing, but as a personal thing that has to do with you. If it wasn't for you or people like you, it wouldn't exist. You'd have no, to be nothing. And I believe, I have no doubt that if there was only one person in the world who needed salvation, there'd still be a cross. If you were the only one, that would still exist in the same way. Because he would leave 99 for the one. So therefore, you can take that as if it was simply for you, for everybody but you. It exists just as much for you as anybody. The love of God, that is your mohar. Because, because there was a bride, because there was a you, there was that. Because there was a you, and because the mohar exists because there's a bride, and because there is someone who loves the bride. So the cross exists not as some historical thing alone. It exists because there was a you, and there was someone who loved you. There was someone who loved you. For every visit of the bridegroom must culminate in the mohar, in the offering of the sacrificial gift. That is what the cross is. The bridegroom would give money or shekels of silver or gold or jewelry, something representing his love. But this bridegroom gave more than that. The mohar for us is not silver or gold. It is written, He did not give us silver and gold. We were not redeemed by that. We were redeemed by the precious blood of the Lamb, of Him. 
It says in 1 Corinthians 6, You have been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. Listen to what you've read before, but see it in a new light, in the light of the Mohar. Ephesians 5, Husbands, love your wives, even as Messiah loved the church and gave Himself up for it, that He might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of the Word, that He might present to Himself a glorious church bride. Not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but it should be without blemish. He gave Himself up for her, the bride, that she might be presented to Him as a bride. The bridegroom always gives to the bride. So the bridegroom of bridegrooms, God Himself, He must give something. And He didn't give something, He gave Himself. That is the greatest gift that could ever be the very life of God. He gave Himself up. What is our salvation? Our salvation is the mohar, the gift of love that is given by the one who comes to us. At the end of His visit, He gives it up. That is, He gives it up for the creation. He gives it up for, the, for man. He gives it up for us. Rebecca. For Rebecca, it was riches. From the father, riches from the father, Abraham. For Rachel, Jacob didn't have money. So what he did is he slaved, he labored for seven, seven years and seven again. Kind of like the creation, God doing something. But here we have God giving himself. And God, what did Abraham say to Isaac, to his son? He said, God shall provide himself the land. There's a few ways you can take that. You have a, we have a different mohar. Not merely, not just the riches of God, not just the power of God, not just the possessions of God. We've got God Himself as a gift. Not only as the giver, but as the gift. What does it mean? It means the cross, the death of Messiah, isn't just an event. It's not just a religious thing. It's the Mohar. It's a dynamic living thing. It's filled with power to change things. Let's open that up. And if you get this, and if you apply this, it can and will change your life. What is the mystery of the Mohar? What does it mean for you, the secrets of the Mohar? First of all, it means this. The fact that that exists, that that's a real event, it means, number one, you are loved. You are truly, for real, actually loved. A price has been given for you personally. And this price is the life of God Himself. The price given for you is priceless. It's beyond anything. It's infinite. Why? Because that's how much you are loved by God. It's, in other words, it's not just that God is infinite, which He is, but now the gift that represents His love to you is just as infinite. It's the, all, the whole part of God. It's not, it's not just one part of God. It's all of God. You know, it says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. But the fact is, He first loved you with all His heart, mind, soul, and strength. That's what it is. How much you are loved is infinite. That's why you are infinitely loved. In the Hebrew Scriptures, it says this. It says, I have loved you with an everlasting love. You can translate that, I have loved you with an infinite love, an unending love. How much are you loved? Infinitely loved. You are so loved. God didn't just love you. He so loved you that He gave His only begotten Son. That's the Mohar. You are so loved beyond what you can imagine. You could not possibly be more loved than you are loved right now. If everyone in the world loved you with all their greatest love, and you had never known anything in your life but love, if you had never been rejected, if you had never known rejection or abandonment, if you've never been betrayed or hurt by people or wounded or broken or overlooked, it still would not compare how much with how much you are loved now. Every wound, every hurt in your life, every rejection, every lack of love in your life is not worthy to be compared with how much you are loved in God through the Mohar that He gave for you. You are the most loved person in all the earth except for everybody else. But nobody else is more loved than you. For all who have received the Mohar. 
You could not be more loved. You couldn't handle more love than you have in God. And if you get this, you never have to live in rejection again or hurt or wounding or dwelling on what has been done to you. Not that you don't know it, but that it is swamped by the love and power and healing of God. You never have to be afraid of rejection anymore if you know how much you love, how loved you are. You imagine that. Why are we afraid of rejection if we have so much love? Or of man, fear, or of abandonment, or of anything. Because you can be free of, you can even be free of yourself if you are so loved, you don't have to walk around trying to be loved. And trying to get people to praise you. You don't have to because you're so filled with true love. That's why it says, therefore, live a life of love now. Because you, as a beloved child, as imitators of God, as beloved children, live a life of love as Messiah loved you and gave himself for you. It means you can be healed and full and whole and blessed and beyond. You are loved more than you can imagine. The Mohar is a sign to show everybody in that house how much that bride is loved. And to show the bride how much she's loved. The Mohar, God's love on the cross, is a sign of His love for you to show the universe how much He loves you. To show the world how much He loves you. To show the angels how much He loves you. To show the devils how much He loves you. And to show you how much He loves you. So that all would know. So it means it doesn't matter what you're feeling. Whether you feel love or you don't feel love, whether you've known human love or you've never known human love, it doesn't matter at all. What's around you, what's happening in your life, is not. whether you're feeling it doesn't matter, whether you're not feeling it doesn't matter, you hold fast to the reality of the mohar, the price of God, which does not change. When you're feeling distant from God, that price doesn't change. When you've just fallen on your face in sin, it doesn't change. It doesn't change the love or diminish it one bit. You cannot change it. You can receive it or not, but you cannot change it. For what can separate us? Who can separate us from the love of God? Can the sword and famine and war and all these things, past, present, and future, demons and angels, height and death, no, none of these things can. None of these things have the power to separate you from the love of God. So we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. You are loved, and this is a sign of it, and you don't need any other sign. It changes not. The mohar is the cost of the always the cost of the bridegroom. Remember this tell, that this salvation is is free to us, but it's not cheap. It's costly. It's a great price for Him to do what He did to suffer judgment because of one thing. So you wouldn't have to because how much he loved you. A great price was paid and a costly love was given. The cost of God's own life. That's how much it costs. How much did it cost to redeem you? God's life. Wow. And how should you live? How should we live? We should also live a costly life. Not because it costs us, but because the price has been paid. We've got the cost in our life. We've got, you know, the word precious comes from price. So here it is, because the price is paid, we can live a life that is precious to God. So what does it mean? He has given such a price, so it means when He asks you to give up that sin, so what? That's nothing compared to what He gave you. You should do it joyfully. You, what, what big deal? What a deal you got. God gave us the greatest price. He asked us to give up these little things. How much? In view of the mohar, whatever He asked you to give up is a breeze. Do it. Live your life as a costly life, willing to pay any price as a joy for the infinite price that was paid for you in His love. It is telling you something. We receive in the bridegroom, not only this, this mohar is not, it's not silver, it's God Himself, it's His essence in our life. We actually have Him in our life. It's our treasure. He belongs to you. The one thing you have in this world and in the world to come is Him. Everything else will come and go. But the one thing you have is Him. Because He gave Himself. The bride and virtue, and by the same token, the bride belongs to the bridegroom. She's been purchased. You belong to Him. 
You're not your own, but He's not His own. He's yours. That's a much better deal. It's a good trade for us. In Hebrew, when you say you have something, you can't really say that in Hebrew. The way you say it is, it is li or yesh li or shen li. It means to say that I don't really have a car. I don't really have a house. The house is to me. It's all to me. I don't have it, but it's to me. That's how you say I have it. So in order to say God, I have God, you say God is to me. In other words, God gave himself to you. God gave, that's why you could say he's mine. Therefore, in the same way, if you say I belong to God, it means you don't just belong to him, you give yourself to him every day. You give yourself, you, you, you give whatever you have, whatever you have, and Lord, it's to you. That's why. It means you're, see, it's great that, to say that I am God's. God has me. But not only does he have me, but by saying that I belong to him, therefore my life is precious. Because I'm the possession of God. If I'm not, if I'm no, if I'm myself, my own possession is worth nothing. It means my life is not worthless. My life is priceless in God. Not because of how great I am or how great you are, but because how great the price was to pay for us. That made us precious. You are bought with a price. Now, you can say that the bride can say, uh, Do de li, I am, my, my beloved is mine, but I'm a lo, and I am his. It starts by her saying, he's mine, therefore I am his. Because he gave himself to me totally, I will, how can I do any less for him? It's a precious life. So live a precious life. That means don't give yourself to anything cheap. Don't give yourself to that sin anymore because you're cheapening yourself. Don't get, because then you're owned by the sin. Don't give yourself to anything dark. Don't even give yourself to fear. That's dark. You only are owned by Him. Nothing else has the right. So Messiah said, actually Paul said, sin shall not be master over you. Because you belong to God. Therefore you are free. You are not bound. When that's one time Mohar is given, the Mohar is given and received. That bride is not bound anymore to that house. So therefore, once the mohar has been given, and if you've received it, and in as much as you've received it, you can say, I am no longer bound to that thing anymore. I am not bound to my old life. I am not bound to anything in my old life. You may have been an alcoholic. You may have been a drug addict. You may have been promiscuous. You may have been a manipulator, a schemer, a bitter person, a selfish person. It all means nothing anymore. The mohar has been given. You are cut free from that. You are not that anymore by the blood of Messiah. You are no longer because more powerful, far more powerful, is the blood of Messiah, the love of God. Then why are some people still bound? Because they don't yet know what they have. They haven't really gotten it yet. They're still going by the old instead of the new. Just like a bride. What would a bride do if the, if the price was paid, but she didn't believe it? She didn't take it in. She never really knew it in her heart. She'd still be living down. A bride. So if you're living down, you're like a bride who doesn't realize what's been done. If you do, you will become free. The Son has set you free. You are free indeed. The one who receives the Mohar, and I have been purchased by him, is no longer of the old house. They might be in it, but I'm not of it anymore. I might be in this world, but I'm not of it anymore. I might be surrounded by problems, but I'm not of those problems anymore. What happened? What's the other secret of the Mohar? If the Mohar is given, it changes the identity of the bride. She's no longer just a girl. She's now the Kala, the bride. So whatever you were in your old life, once that's all you knew, but once there is a Mohar given, it makes all the difference. You are no longer to be haunted by your past, or limited by your past, or paralyzed, or wounded by, or crippled by your past. You now have the mohar of the bridegroom. That changes everything. You're free. If you'll receive it, you'll be free. You are not who you were if you're in Him. You are now whom He declares you to be, the Kalah. The gift of Messiah is stronger than this world. The secret of the mohar. It changes the way you see things. The bride looks at her house, but it looks different now. 
If not, it looks, it looks the same on the outside, but it's not. All of a sudden, this is not my home. I'm not going to be bound by this. This is my, I'm leaving. I'm not going to, I'm not going to, I'm not going to go crazy over it. And I'm not going to fall apart because of it. Because this is not the end anymore. I got a better place. And the same way, you may see that problem, you may see that thing, but that's not the end anymore for you. Whatever you're going through, you need to be able to look beyond it and say, that's not it. This is leading to something better. God says he's going to work it all for good. This is it. It's got, I got more in my life. This is not the final story. The problem is in the final story. The hatred is in the final story. The sickness is in the final story at all. Neither is the temptation and the glitter. That's not the final story either. It looks different. It gives you the power not to be owned by this world. Not to be owned by these things or defined by anything so old. The Mohar, one of the secrets of the Mohar, the power of the Mohar, is it gives you the power to leave, to walk away from that which you could not walk away from before. To walk away from the bondage you couldn't walk away from. To walk into newness of life that you couldn't walk into. She's walking into something new now. To change, she's going to move forward. And the Mohar, she becomes Kiddushin. She becomes consecrated, holy, so you, by that, you become consecrated to God. And that means holy. But the thing is, you don't, you become holy before you experience being holy. You become holy before you deserve to be called holy. You could have just fallen in sin and you feel anything but holy, but by the Mohar, the blood of Messiah declares you holy before you even deserve that holiness. You believe it, you receive it, and then you live it. The Mohar gives the power to trans for the bride to transcend everything around her. She can live transcendent, meaning everything around her, not going to be limited by this anymore. To, 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 to get beyond your problems, beyond yourself, beyond your fears, breakthrough, power of breakthrough. She's able to break out of that life. The secret of the Mohar, once given, it gives the bride hope. A life of hope. She's looking forward now. She's got expectation now. She's got, she's got a, a confidence that greater things are yet to come. She's got an anticipation of joy ahead. The power of the Mohar means you have the power to live a life of hope. No matter what happens, I'm still going to hope. No matter what happens, i got something better. Better, better than the story. Without the Mohar, the world, everybody in the world, they have only one thing to look forward to. That's a funeral. But with a Mohar, we look forward to a wedding. We are a people of hope. No matter who you even the Mo, no matter what you are, what you've been, you still yet you hope, but you hope, stubborn hope. You've got hope, no matter what. You've got a gift, you've got an engagement, you've got a down payment of things better, so you've got hope. That's what God says. That's what you know, the world says. Got milk? Who cares? Got him? You've got hope. You got him? you got hope. The power of the Mohar is the power to change that girl into the Kala. The Kala. The bride. But in Hebrew, the word Kala literally means the perfect one. Why? Because that's how the bridegroom sees her. We have the power to live in the beginning, to live in the perfect of God. Perfect forgiveness, perfect grace, perfect love, per becoming perfected, beautified in his eyes. The moha. Everything comes and goes in this world, but here we are in 2013 and still the 21st century and still the chief reality, the chief image, the chief issue is this cross, is this mohar of the bride. And the Mohar that God gave. When everything else passes away, the love of God still remains, still abides, still is there. The gift of God is what it is. And what happens once that thing is, that price is given? The bride starts preparing for the bridegroom. Starts getting ready for the wedding. Becoming beautiful. Getting ready to say goodbye. Treading a little lightly around her house. Because she's looking forward to something. She's got to get ready for something. To head out for something. What? What? She's getting ready for blessing. 
What is the power of the Mohar? It means so that no matter what your life has been, no matter what, once the Mohar is given and received, and to the degree that you receive it, you let your soul receive it, you've got the power to head for blessing. In God, by the blood of Messiah, you've got the power to head for blessing. It does, this is not some pie in the sky thing. This is the reality of God. It's not promising you this or that. It's promising you blessing from God. In God, by the cross, by the blood of Messiah, by His life, it says all things will be worked together in your life for good for those of you who love Him. You've got the power to head for blessing. No matter what you're going from, no matter what you've been into, no matter what you've been into today, you still have the power to take it new in God and head for blessing. The Mohar turns everything into blessing, even turns curses into blessing. The Lord works all things. You've got the power by the Mohar to turn everything for the good of God. You've got the power to take the worst situation and turn it by God for blessing. By the Mohar once given, as much as you will receive it, you have the power listen, to head for blessing. Blessing, no matter what. You can say, no matter what, by His blood, by His blood, I am heading for blessing. By His love, I am heading for blessing. If the more has been given, you've got all this. Why haven't so many lives, even that have known of Him, haven't done it? Because they've never really received what this means. For the news is, the Mohar has been given. And the more has been given for you, and if you were the only one, it would have been given. And it's over your life. And if you will, and as much as you will, receive this, you can walk in freedom. You can say goodbye to the rejection of your life, to the wounds of your life, say goodbye, to the sins of your life, say goodbye, to the bondages of your life, to the past, to the darkness, to the chains of your life, to the fears of your life and the habits of your life. If you believe it, you can say goodbye to that old life. And you can walk in freedom and newness and hope and stubborn victory. Take it. Go with it. Receive it. Believe in it. And you will head for blessing. Happy Good Friday. Amen and amen. Hallelujah. We praise you. The bride praises you. The bride praises the bridegroom. We give praise and thanks for the gift that we can say we're free. We are free and we're victorious. The bride praises the bridegroom. We praise you for the gift, Lord. We praise you for the blessing, Lord. We praise you for the freedom, Lord. We praise you for the promise, Lord. We bless you, Lord God, for everything you've done. Yeshua, Jesus, our Hatan. We bless you tonight and thank you for the goodness of Good Friday. We bless you and thank you. Our eyes are closed. Everybody please keep your eyes closed for one more moment. With our eyes closed. If you don't know right now where you, that you've received the Mohar, you've received the gift that changes everything, you need to receive it. If you are not sure you're born again, you need to be. You need to be. If you're not born again, you need to be saved because there's no other way to be saved. Jesus said it. Messiah said there's only two roads. One road leads to heaven. The other to hell. It's either life or death. That's it. That's it. There's only two. And you're either on one road or the other. And The only way to be on the road to heaven is if you're born again. Jesus said it himself. He said, you must be born again. Or you cannot see the kingdom of God. You can't enter heaven. It doesn't matter if you're Catholic, Protestant, Jew. It doesn't matter any of that. Because none of religion didn't set the bride free. It was the gift received for real. And he said, when you receive it, you become born again. So it's real. It's to each of us. It's you and him. And if you were the only one on earth, I have no doubt he would have done it. It's for you personally. But the gift, what happens if the gift's given, but you don't, it's not received? That means you stay in the old, you stay in the dark. That's what the, the bride would have done. She would have not known anything else. And then when we, then we're on the wrong road, we're heading away from God, and once that's over, we're heading, that's hell, that's judgment. 
Because we're, we're joining to the darkness. And that's where it is. That's eternal judgment. But God loves you so much. He gave His only Son. He gave Himself. He gave the Mohawk for you. And that's the way out. And that's the way in. And so if you're not sure you're born again, you're on the wrong road. And, and there's a day of judgment coming where it's either heaven or hell. And, and I ask you, how long do you have? How long do you have until that day? How far are you from that day? The answer is one heartbeat. Because the moment that heartbeat stops, it's, that's it. That's the day. The heartbeat you have every moment is a gift from God. Your whole life is hanging on the heartbeat that God gave you. And He gave it to you so you could find Him and say yes to Him and receive while you're here. Afterwards, you can't receive. So this is it. We make our choice. So listen. If you're not sure you're born again, you need to be. And the good news is God won't reject you. He said, I won't turn away. Not one person. doesn't matter what your life has been. Take that heartbeat like the Lord knocking on your life and say, open up. I, he's the bridegroom coming to you. Say, open up. Receive. And you'll be free. He says, come to me, you, all you who are weary, and I'll give you rest. And I'll give you rest. And I'll receive you. I'm not going to turn you away. But you need to come. Here's your moment. And it's like the Lord is passing by as He did. The disciples said, follow me. And if they received Him, that was it. That was it. But, if, but if they turned away, they missed it. And he's, right now, He's passing through. He's calling you by name. Don't miss the moment. Don't miss your moment. Because you may not have it again. You may not be open tomorrow. But now you are. God is calling you by name saying, come to me, you. And I will not reject you. Here it is. Here's the moment. How do, you, how do you become born again? The Bible says, receive Him. Say yes to His call. Trust and believe in Him. Make Him the Lord of your life. The One who gave Himself for you and overcame death. And here's the anniversary today. And here He's calling you. That He did it for you. So I'm going to pray a simple prayer. The Bible says it can begin this way. With a simple prayer. It says, if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, you shall be saved. So I'm going to lead in a very simple prayer to say yes to God. This is for your sake. And we're going to pray together in this sanctuary. Wherever you are, just pray. The Lord's tugging on your heart. This is your moment. Don't miss it. For your sake, just pray. Just repeat the words. You can do it in a whisper. But say it, as the Bible says. You can do it in a whisper, but mean in your heart. Say, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. And I'm going to pray that prayer and so we, to say yes to follow Him. So if you're not sure you're born again, if you don't know where you, for sure where you're going to be a thousand years from now, you need to know that if you're in the wrong place, you're going to be in the wrong place, you need to come in. That's why God is leading you right now and talking to you. And maybe if you've known God, but you haven't known freedom, you haven't really received this power, you haven't really been fully confident, you need to pray too. Make it your own prayer. And maybe the Lord... Maybe you've been okay, but there's something waiting to happen that God is calling you to. A freedom, a breakthrough. And it comes through this, what we talked about. You pray too. And say, yes, God. Make Him the Lord of every part. Let's pray right now. We're going to pray together. Just repeat after me now as we pray together. As we pray together, just repeat after me a simple, simple prayer to say yes to God. And it's going to be right now, in a whisper, but mean it to God. Just repeat after me these words. Just repeat in a whisper these words now. Lord God, I come to you now. I open my heart and I say yes to you. Yes to your love. Yes to your call. I'm going to follow you wherever you go. Thank you for loving me, giving your life for me. Thank you for dying for my sins and rising from death that I could be saved. Thank you for being the one who loved me. And I, Lord, this day, this moment, I say yes. Yes to your call. Yes to your love. Yes to your gift. I receive your gift to be set free. I receive your gift to be made new. I receive your gift 
to be able to turn away from the bondage, from the old, from my sins. I repent and I turn. And Lord, I receive your love, your grace, your cleansing, your forgiveness, your presence, the gift. And I'm going to live free. I'm going to live victoriously in you. I make you the Lord of every part of my life. From this moment, lead me on. And I'm following with all my heart. I am your disciple. You are my God. You are mine and I'm yours. Thank you, Lord. By this prayer and your word, I can say, I am blessed. I am free. I am new. I'm forgiven. I have new life. All things are new. And I'm with you. I'm saved. I'm born again. I'll be with you forever. Leave me on from this moment and all the days of my life. As I follow you from glory to glory, away from the old and into the blessings of the new, in the name of the Bridegroom, Messiah Jesus, in His holy name I pray. I say, Amen. Amen. Our eyes are closed.